in her. Well, hello everybody. What a surprise to see you all here. Uh, first of all, I just want to say how thrilled I am to have this person up here um, who is an amazing culinary resource. Uh, she is so incredibly well-rounded. She writes, she cooks, she teaches. She has uh, the Cook's Warehouse, cookwarehouse.com. Uh, and um, she's just an amazing individual, and I'm so proud and thrilled that she took the time to join me today to do this silly little thing that we're gonna do. So, <laughs> so thank you, thank you. So fun. And happy to have you all here, thank yes. you guys. Uh, in case you don't know, my name is Kelly Hansen. I'm the lead singer of a little rock band named Foreigner. some uh, dishes today and I'm going to talk about, I guess, my culinary journey. Uh, <laughs> and then later on we can, we'll ask some questions, or she's going to ask some questions for me. I'm, I'm going to learn a lot from her today. And uh, um, uh, So where do you want to start? You want to start cooking first or should I start talking about how I got into this? Well, I'll start putting together the creamy carrot soup okay. while you talk about how you got into it. All right, the first thing, we're going to do this creamy carrot soup, a raw soup. Uh, so uh, it's funny, I didn't know where I would end up in the food world, but I, I can tell you my first job was in a restaurant when I was 15. And I just found a pay stub from 1975. Wow. <laughs> where I made $1.25 an hour, and I was damn glad to get it. Yeah. And uh, so I started out that way, and I, maybe that affected my, my uh, love for food, but when I was a struggling musician early on, um, it was very hard to have good food. And uh, went through those peanut butter and uh, jelly days and the ramen noodle days and all that kind of stuff. But once in a while, I'd be able to make a meal for myself. Uh, and I think it was really when I joined Foreigner be uh, because I had not been on the road for uh, 15 years. I had been at home uh, producing, engineering, developing artists, all that kind of stuff. Uh, because I had to take a break in the singing world because in around 1990, this thing called grunge came in, and I was in a like a glam metal band, and it killed the whole heavy metal scene pretty much. And I, no one wanted to hear my kind of voice, so I knew I was going to have to take some time out, and I was going to have to explore other areas of my music uh, career. So, uh, so I hadn't been on the road for 15 years, and I got this uh, feeling one day that I, I was working harder and getting less for what I was doing, and I. Finally, one day woke up and said, I need to go back to what I do best, which is lead singing. I hadn't been doing it. So I decided to say to myself, I'm, I'm not going to say no to anything until I can't say yes anymore. Does that sound right? Yeah. And um, so I went on the internet back uh, in uh, what, 2005. I can remember being on the internet in 2005. And, uh, and I heard about a... a charity event that Mick Jones, the leader and founder of Foreigner, was doing in Santa Barbara just a couple hours uh, north of where I live. And, uh, and I didn't know if it was a, a Foreigner thing or whether Mick Jones was going to do a new uh, project. I didn't know. But I decided to pursue it. And since I had been in the business, been around the block, I made a couple phone calls. And, uh, and I got in touch with management. And the band had been dormant, basically, since 2002. Uh, Lou left for the second time. Lou Graham, the original singer of the band, left in 2002. And uh, so, long story short, I got in the band, and it took off like a juggernaut. And we were on the road for eight months a year, and I had been doing that for 15 years straight. Um, yeah, like, like, we're glad you're back. Glad you're back. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, but it made me realize once I started getting on the road that um, there's there starts to arise issues with being able to eat the way you want to eat when you're on the road. Um, firstly, one of the uh, glaring and annoying occurrences that happens almost daily is the difference between the description on the menu or the picture of the food and what you get when you finally gets to your door. And um, uh, that became, started to become an issue. And then uh, as, as I, I'm a singer for a living, I really have to take care of my voice and I had to start, I noticed I start having to do things, sacrifice one extra thing a year to maintain my same level of vocal ability and physical ability. So every year it's like this New Year's resolution where I, I give up something else. 
And uh, so I had to give up eating spicy food at night and you know, this, that, and the other. Uh, but I, so it started focusing me, directing me to think about how I was eating, what I was eating, and how I was going to get it the way I needed to get it. Uh, sometimes when you're on a big summer tour like we, like we have coming up this summer starting uh, July 9th in Albuquerque and going through September with Kansas and Europe, um, we have a traveling uh, catering company that travels with us and you can really dictate exactly what you'd like to have, what kind of stuff you want to cycle through every day. But in a regular uh, road touring situation, that's almost impossible. And being a singer, most of the time, because I'm doing a very challenging set of songs, they're very high, okay? And the older you get, the harder it is to sing very high. In fact, um, uh, I am uh, in vocal trouble right now, but I wanted to be with you guys today, so I'm drugged up like you can't believe. And, uh, but, uh, you know, singing very high is, is difficult, and, and it means you really gotta think about what you're doing with your voice. So I started um, noticing that when I would come home off the road, I really enjoyed going to the market and getting stuff I liked, and knew exactly what ingredients I was gonna put in my meal. I could source the kind of stuff I was getting. I knew where that chicken was coming from. I knew where that fish was coming from. If you're staying at some hotel in, in somewhere in Nowheresville, you have no idea where the stuff is coming from and what the quality is, but I can guarantee you this, it's probably not the best. Um, so that really began my interest. And then I, um, in 2009, no, 2005, no, five? 2005 or six, I did a like a celebrity cooking competition at the Atlanta Motor Speedway with uh, Mario Vitale and, and uh, Tim Love and uh, Guy Fieri, and we partnered up with uh, a couple of racers and me. And so Tim Love and I, uh, who if you know Tim Love, he's got all of these great restaurants in Texas. He's a grilling master. We've done a couple events together. Um, uh, we won, of course, and uh, nice. and my trophy was uh, you know a nice. Uh, Pepper, pepper milk. But, uh, that gave me entree into the world of celebrity chefs and high-end professional chefs. So, of course, I started keeping in touch with these people and talking to them and going to their restaurants. And when you know celebrity chefs, it's amazing because when you go to your their restaurants, you get like free food <laughs> and you always get free dessert and. Uh, uh, sometimes you'll get every right? single what? You're not eating much dessert. No, I usually have one. Oh, that's another thing with my thing. I have. I can have one or two bites of a dessert. I don't have to eat it all. It's a whole struggle about uh, moderation. And I know that some of you uh, have addictive personalities, like some people I know, and they say you're absolutely insane. You're going to have one bite of that chocolate cake. And I go, well, at least I get to taste it. Um, but I don't have to down it. I have to wear these size 28s on stage every night. <laughs> that takes some discipline. You know what um, Julia Child said? What? One must take moderation and moderation. Yeah, well, sure, <laughs> sure. That's true. It's very true. And I do have, um, because I have so many culinary opportunities, I do take advantage of that. Um, but, you know, then you got to do a few extra laps or a few more sit-ups or what you have to do. Um, so in the keeping in touch with these friends of mine, I started to learn more. I started to educate myself. I was always watching the food channel and I was watching all of the cooking channels on TV. Every segment, every day, I started becoming kind of really obsessed with it. Uh, and finally I said to uh, one of the people in my, in my crew, uh, I said, I would really like to get on that, that uh, cooking uh, network show Chopped. And uh, my great publicist, uh, Vanessa Menkes, um, she was able to secure me a position on Chopped. So uh, it was a celebrity edition, which means they're a little bit easier on you. They don't make you uh, have some crazy, wacky, uh, outrageous basket. Uh, they try to be tongue in cheek and make it kind of music themed. Uh, but um, that was a real experience, and if you've ever watched the show and ever wondered, it is real. It, there is no BS in that. Um, it's as hard as it looks. It's as nerve-wracking as, uh, as it seems. I spent more time sweating about doing that show than I ever did uh, getting on stage in front of 50,000 people to sing a song. Wow. And um, a I was researching. <laughs> yeah. I was making sauces. I was on the internet going, what's the weirdest chopped basket that's ever been, you know, uh, given? I did all that stuff. 
And the saving grace of the day is when we went in to do the chopped episode, uh, the, it, was, it, was the, it was the dead of winter. It was February in, I believe, 2014. And um, the, uh, the studios where they do the, the chop is right above Chelsea Market in New York City, uh, which is above a bunch of great restaurants and, and, yeah. and accessory oh, stores great. and things like that. And, uh, but the, the heater was broken. So in, in the studio, in the, in the cooking kitchen there, it was actually okay, it wasn't pleasant. You've seen shows where people are like sweating like mad. Well, it was really kind of nice and cool. So that really saved me that day. Uh, so I went on uh, that and I ended up winning that as well. And um, yeah. oh, thank you. Awesome. How many of you have seen that episode? You can still, yeah. so just go like to Netflix or whatever and you can dial it up, I think for $1.99, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I think the I think the dish that really um, really locked it in for me was I uh, I had just been to India, and if you ever get a chance to go to India and taste real Indian food, you you it'll sour you on most of the um, regular Indian dishes that you get here unless you go to some really great place like I just went to the Ala Masala House, uh, Manita uh, Chauhan's restaurant in Nashville, uh, because. In India, every dish is a completely unique flavor, taste, texture, as opposed to here where they'll make three different sauces and they'll make lamb, chicken, and, and beef, and then they'll just exchange the sauces, and it's really sad. Uh, so I had just been to India, and uh, the, the main course basket consisted of a lamb T-bone, and, uh, and I immediately thought I was going to make a, a curry sauce for it. So. Uh, I had, they let you preview the kitchen, you walk around the day before, and you see what's on the shelves, and you notice that they're very cheeky. What they do is they, they don't give you three, three blenders or four blenders, they always give you one less than who was ever up that round, so that you have to get to it. And I noticed that there was one can of coconut cream, and uh, I had noticed that before, and it kind of was in the back of my mind, but when I saw that lamb T-bone, uh, I was lucky enough to have the stage position, or the stage position, the kitchen position that was closest to the pantry. You also ran. Was, I think uh, I, I, think I ran, ran yes. over and I grabbed that coconut <laughs> cream like you couldn't believe. It. And uh, so uh, another ingredient was beer. And so first of all, I, I, uh, I boom put some canola oil in the pan. I salt and peppered those steaks. I cut off that big tongue that's on the top of the lamb T-bone because I'd seen that on Chopped. And. Uh, <laughs> And I put those on to sear while I worked on some other stuff. When I turned them over, I couldn't believe the beautiful sear that I had on them. It was it blew my mind. So, and I uh, I had gotten some uh, some uh, Indian spices uh, from the kitchen. I got some star anise and some turmeric, and I can't remember what else I got. Um, but I after they cooked on the, the stove top, I, I put them in to the um, uh, to the oven because they give you the oven preheated to 450. Uh, so I put that in there and I had that beer and I thought, oh, there's all this fat in there. I've got these uh, spices going. I put all that together and I put the beer in there. And uh, when it came out, I took the steaks out to rest. And I'm thinking of all this, you have, you have to, you know, uh, was it 20 minutes I think it is, or half an hour? And your, your mind's going a million miles an hour. And I knew that I want those steaks done first so I can let them rest. So as they rested, I looked back at the stove and I saw this beautiful brown bubbling sauce in the pan. And I opened that can of coconut cream and I didn't shake it. And I just opened it up and there's this block of solid coconut cream and I just took a Yum. big scoop of that there <laughs> and I put it in that pot. And I got raves from those judges. And, uh, and, I, and I made a couple of good friends on the show. Chris Santos is now a good friend of mine, lives really close by to me in, uh, in Los Angeles now. So these are the kind of things that have fueled me forward uh, in my cooking journey. And uh, I'm just so happy to be able to come up here and talk to you guys about food and about music too. So uh, when we get to that too, I'll talk about anything you want to talk about, music and eating and how that affects you or anything like that. So but let's make some soup. Yeah, let's do All it. Right?